Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you might be. This is Frederick Winsness with uh, NetHope, and I want to welcome everyone to a very exciting uh, webinar today in the NetHope Solutions Center and the ICT for the webinar series. Today we're going to talk about fighting malaria with the help of digital technologies. And as usual in the series, we have a host of panelists. We have people from uh, Humanitarian Open Street Map, from CRS, of course, from ACROS uh, Malaria Consortium, and Vital Wave. And uh, before we get started, uh, I will just go over quick housekeeping rules. Uh, we'd like to make this as uh, interactive as possible, so please uh, post your questions in the chat window, and we will have a uh, Q&A session towards the end of the hour today. Uh, we are recording the session today, and uh, the slides and the recording will be posted to the NetHope Solutions Center uh, uh, later on today, and there will be a follow-up email for, for you uh, to find that uh, posting, as well as uh, uh, your opportunity to share with colleagues and others that might be interested in this topic. And uh, at the very end, when you leave the webinar, you'll see a, a webinar satisfaction poll pop up in your uh, web browser. And we certainly would appreciate you taking a minute or so to answer those questions for us to improve this webinar series going forward. So uh, without any further ado, I will pass it over to uh, Sonia, who's going to be uh, monitoring the rest of the session. So here we go, Sonia. Thank you very much, Frederick. Um, and yes, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, today's session, we'll be looking at fighting malaria with the help of digital technologies, um, as nearly half of the world's population is at risk of contracting malaria. And at the same time, also mobile health applications have rapidly grown in the recent years. So um, in today's interactive session, you will hear from um, various expert speakers representing um, different organizations and um, sharing practical advice and tips on how they are designing um, technology or using digital technology to help fight malaria from prevention to elimination. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to our um, diverse um, speaker panel. Um, uh, we have um, Annie Martin, she's the research lead at ACROS Group. Uh, Nathan Brassell, he's the senior manager of ICT for D business development and program design at Catholic Relief Services. Jess Butler, um, project man manager and technical advisor at the Humanitarian Open Street team. And Sarah Marks, a digital health strategy specialist at the Malaria Consortium. And Derek Treatman, the director of technology solutions at Vital Wave. Uh, so thank you all very much for joining us and speaking at this webinar. Um, we will have uh, one question for each speaker um, that they will address, in a, um, and then we like to open the discussion to the audience. So if you are inspired uh, to ask any questions for the speaker, please post them in the chat box. And um, we really like this to be an interactive session. So. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, ask the first question. It's uh, for Annie. Um, how do digital solutions need to change or adapt to work best in malaria control settings versus malaria elimination settings? Over to you, Annie. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So I, I first just want to clarify the difference between when we're talking about malaria control settings versus malaria elimination settings. And we refer to malaria control as more of a general term or a general effort to reduce the amount of malaria cases and deaths when we're you know, in a high transmission setting where we have many, many cases uh, to a lower amount. Malaria elimination generally means we're talking about a location or a phase where we already have reduced cases and burden significantly and we're working from already a lower burden area to, to essentially to elimination. And the reason this distinction matters is that different types of interventions are more effective depending on the transmission intensity. In, in higher transmission settings, widespread vector control is going to be very effective in curbing in incidents. So for example, indoor residual spraying, uh, bed net distribution. Once transmission drops or starts to drop 
vector control needs to be more targeted uh, to where hotspots of disease are. So we know, so we need to know, you know, where where cases actually are. We need to have better surveillance to inform that information. And then once disease burden drops to what we would consider elimination levels, generally this is around 200 cases per per thousand people. At that point, stronger surveillance is, is even more important. You you have to be able to track and treat individual cases because it could end up being that it's just within a community, a handful of people, or even a, a very small amount of people that is containing the parasite that's allowing malaria transmission to continue in that community. Now, that means the interventions themselves must also be supplemented by more focused effort beyond just vector control. We're talking about mass drug administration, which is aiming to treat entire communities, um, also improve surveillance and improve test and treat protocols. So, what does all this mean from the digital tools perspective? It means we need to have tools that can support both the preventative interventions uh, as well as tools that are supporting and improving and strengthening surveillance and response systems. So that means we need tools that are helping potentially large teams, very large teams, delivering services very widely to thousands of people as with net distribution campaigns. Uh, but we also need tools that can help us pinpoint one individual person or a handful of people at any point in time and deliver services to those people. So for now, I'll just share a few thoughts on the, the former, tools for delivering preventative services at scale like indoor residual spraying. So with, with vector control strategies, uh, the goal when we're rolling them out in mass is, is to, in its name, attack, attack the vector. Um, What's challenging is that oper operationalizing the, the rollout of these kinds of interventions uh, is, is extremely uh, intensive on human resources, on expense, and on time. But in order for these vector control strategies to be done correctly and effectively, they have to achieve high coverage. So the investment is high, but the, the bar for effective delivery is also high. Uh, so what that means is that if, if you're in a village, say, delivering indoor residual spraying, because you're trying to effectively prevent mosquitoes, the vectors, from being able to frequently travel around that village, biting different people, if you're not spraying a high percentage of that village, and research has shown that's around 80%, if you're not spraying a high percentage, then, then you're not effectively controlling the vector, and you have, you're likely not going to see the impact that you would when you are reaching high coverage. So when we're thinking about tools for helping service delivery of these kinds of interventions, we're really trying to think about what can we do to not only collect good data, but to improve the coverage of, of these interventions. And one of the big challenges in improving coverage is knowing where people are, how many people are in what places, and getting the services to them. So in our work at ACROSS, we found that spatial-based tools that can establish better estimates of population and that can actually map out where population is distributed can be, can be game-changing. We've worked with IRS programs, indoor residual spraying programs, to effectively digitally map out where populations are distributed, are distributed and then put mobile tools in the hands of field teams who are doing the indoor residual spraying that actually guide those teams to, to the areas and to the specific structures that they're intending to deliver services to. Simply having a map in, in, what, in the work we've seen greatly improves the team's ability to actually be able to find houses and find villages and make sure that they are achieving high coverage of indoor residual spraying or whatever the intervention might be. And this approach also can help with accountability uh, of, of the teams that are doing the work. It greatly improves data quality and, importantly, the accessibility of the data as well. So what I mean by that is discreetly capturing data, both electronically and electronically with a GPS tag location, essentially or all but eliminates the ability for any data falsification by, by team members and it also adds a level of transparency so that managers of field teams can see in almost real time, exactly what their team is doing and how their team is progressing towards programmatic, programmatic goals. 
So for preventive interventions, especially those that are uh, important in, in the control setting where we're trying to deliver a high quantity of services, uh, for these and even for really elimination focused service delivery as well, electronic spatial data that is routinely collected and routinely available for decision making can make a huge difference in the impact of the services you're actually delivering. I could, I could continue to talk about more examples about how it's relevant for elimination focused interventions as well, but I think I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and, and pass it off to my colleagues, or pass it back to you, Sonia. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Annie. Um, and uh, thank you for your interesting comments. Um, my next question is for Sarah. Um, Sarah, how can digital solutions at community level support malaria control and elimination? Thanks, Sonia. And uh, thanks for the great overview, um, Annie, as well. So, um, so the WHO recommends implementing two sets of interventions in a complementary way as part of the global technical strategy for malaria. And the first is prevention strategies such as um, vector control and in certain settings and populations, chemo prevention. And the second um, is diagnosis and treatment of malaria at both health facility and community level. Um, populations um, in remote or hard to reach areas tend to have higher malaria transmission and uh, combined with poor access to health facilities. Um, consequently, a community-based approach is needed to support delivery of prevention and diagnosis and treatment strategies in, in these areas. And digital solutions can help address the inherent difficulties of working in these places. Um, Annie has talked about how technology um, can support, um, in particular, prevention at the uh, community level. Um, and so I will just focus more on um, the diagnosis and treatment aspect at community level. Um, so community health workers can complement and extend the reach of um, public health services in rural remote areas. Um, as I said, where there is limited access to health facilities um, and there are high caseloads. So, um, so where there are high, um, relatively high caseloads um, of malaria, community health workers may diagnose and treat malaria cases, um, then report aggregated data monthly. Um, however, due to the remoteness of these situations, um, supervision is often lacking. And consequently, the, the quality of, of case management can be affected, um, or the timeliness and the accuracy of the data reported may not be sufficient. Um, this is something that we have found to be the case uh, for malaria data reported by community health workers in Mozambique, for example, uh, through a re recent um, data quality audit exercise, um, where we found 40% um, uh, of um, of data submitted uh, was uh, submitted after the deadline uh, from community health workers, and there were variances between um, data sources at, um, at community level that ranged from 22 to 97 percent. So, in these cases, um, uh, you know, in remote settings, uh, apps can support. Um, can provide decision support and promote appropriate case management of suspected malaria cases um, uh, and uh, have validation rules that can support data accuracy uh, as well as automated reporting that can support consistent and timely reporting. Um, in elimination settings, um, the, probably the use of technology increases it more so as uh, the reliance um, on, on data, as Annie mentioned, sort of increases. Um, and CHWs need to, or community health workers need to be able um, to provide um, you know, immediate diagnosis and treatment, but, but most importantly, case notification. Um, as well as participate in active case detection um, and, and case and, and focus investigations. Uh, so digital tools that support real-time reporting and, and tracking of cases are, are essential here. Um, uh, Malaria Consortium, for example, um, in Mozambique has been working with Community Health Worker Program and uh, UNICEF um, to develop and implement a decision support um, application for community health workers there called Upskill, uh, which guides um, 
the community health workers through the diagnostic process using multimedia and a system with treatment recommendations. It has um, data validation rules and, and automated aggregation of monthly indicators to assist with data accuracy. And data is available in near real time, dependent on network coverage uh, from the server. Um, we're now working in partnership with the National Malaria Control Program and CHI, for example, as well as other partners, um, to see how the system could be adapted to support elimination activities. For example, um, you know, looking at um, how to improve uh, the real-time case notification and uh, have patient tracking um, at um, the, the districts um, and provincial levels as well. Um, as at community health worker level, um, which currently the system has. Um, so I just wanted to just round off by saying, although that digital solutions can resolve some of these issues of working in remote uh, areas, um, there are still, um, they also bring their own uh, problems. And I think uh, we must also bear those in mind and particularly lack of network coverage and power in particular uh, is a problem uh, when considering implementing these types of initiatives. So I'll hand you back to Sonia now. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and, and I also posted uh, the link to the Ma Malaria Consortium, so also please check the um, uh, chat box for any useful links as well. Um, and yeah, reminder to also post questions, please. Um, my next question is for Jess. Uh, Jess, how can open source data and mapping be used to support malaria intervention? Street map team uh, have conducted uh, over the past few years. For a bit of background, we're an international NGO and community of volunteers leveraging open and often crowdsourced map data for disaster response and development work. And that's centered around the use of the platform OpenStreetMap, which is an open and editable map of the world. Uh, so in 2016, we began working with partners such as Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, Digital Globe, uh, Clinton Health Access Initiative, or CHAI, to remotely map buildings across malaria endemic regions of the world so that this data could be used to improve in intervention campaigns. And so remote mapping, uh, what that means is we activated Community of, our community of volunteers to trace, trace the outlines or footprints of buildings, um, as well as other features such as roads and rivers, using aerial imagery and putting that into OpenStreetMap so that partners around the world could use that for their work. Over the course of this campaign, uh, we were able to facilitate nearly 5 million buildings being traced into OpenStreetMap across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, including Botswana, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, as well as Southeast Asia and Central America, including Guatemala. Um, so the majority of these countries where this remote mapping was going on are countries where malaria outbreaks are sometimes isolated or in just some areas of the country, not necessarily spread across the entirety of the country. Um, and a lot of them are on their way to achieving malaria elimination, but are facing various roadblocks. And, and in addition, uh, these are majority countries that use indoor residual spraying as a significant uh, way of controlling malaria. So with indoor residual spraying, as Annie covered briefly, uh, it, in order for it to be effective, about 75 to 80% of structures in an area need to be sprayed. So this is where map data becomes absolutely critical. Because when you don't know how many structures exist in an area, you can't guarantee that you're actually meeting that 75 to 80% effectiveness rate. Uh, in, in many cases, what is happening in many of these countries is homes are being missed um, for various reasons, whether they are further away from a road, uh, so harder to access, um, as well as sometimes hidden from view, or even in some cases, because of political or cultural reasons, might not be reached 
uh, with these indoor residual spray campaigns. So having map data reduces the risk of missing these homes. It reduces bias and increases accountability of these uh, IRS teams as well as helping to find hidden villages. So in many cases, there can be entire communities that haven't previously received indoor residual spraying, but through the use of remote mapping using aerial imagery are now on the map and now are part of these indoor residual spray campaigns. Um, in addition, crowdsourcing this map data allows these ministries of health in various countries to focus their limited resources on using the data for interventions instead of having to create the data themselves. So in 2018, HOT went beyond just facilitating the remote mapping to assisting ministries of health in Botswana and Guatemala in field work and ground truthing. So using this open street map data um, as well as open source mobile data collection applications like Open Map Kit, we trained Ministry of Health staff to visit structures and collect additional data that's crucial for indoor residual spraying, such as building types and structural materials. Uh, structural materials are really critical as some chemicals can be used on some materials and not others, as well as understanding which structures are closed or not, um, and when they're not, if bed nets need to be used instead of spraying. So, by the completion of this data collection, uh, the Ministries of Health are able to now use this ground truth data to calculate the amount of IRS chemicals needed, the number of bed nets needed, staff necessary, as well as now can plan their operations to ensure they're actually hitting that 80% target. Um, and now, because it's with the cycle of using OpenStreetMap data, any data that's not private has been looped back into OpenStreetMap and it is open and available for anyone to use. So what that means is that 50,000 buildings in Botswana and around 6,000 in Guatemala now are in OpenStreetMap with additional data that can not only be used for malaria control work, um, but can all, are also being looked at to be used for other campaigns in the public health sector, such as uh, TB and HIV AIDS campaigns. So that's just of an overview of how we've used open data for these malaria interventions. Thank you very much, Jess. Um, our next question is for Nate. Um, uh, Nate, could you please uh, share some um, practical insights on um, how to select the right technology provider? Yeah, sure. Um, just want to make sure that you all can hear me real quick. Yes, we can. Very All right, fantastic. I had some trouble earlier. Uh, hi, everyone. It's it's great to be a part of this call today and, and part of this panel. It's a very interesting uh, discussion we're having here today. Uh, so, Sonia, um, the question is about selecting right technology partners. Um, so, frankly, it's, it's a really uh, challenging question, a very interesting question. There's a lot of different ways that, that I could take this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll talk about it more generally, um, try to tie it back into the malaria sector, um, and maybe just touch on a few things that jump out at me uh, as being important things to look at. I'm sure folks on this call will have, um, you, know, so, you know, other ideas and other things that we should be looking at, and I think there's many valid ways to tackle this, but I'll just uh, touch on a few. Um, so the first is probably the most obvious, which uh, most people think about, is, is does the technology do what you need it to do? Um, so, if you're doing case management, does it support case management? Does it have the you know, proper reporting to be able to, to monitor cases? If you're doing some sort of mass distribution, does it support um, supply chain um, and tracking of locations of, of where things are and where they're, they, they should be distributed and, and the status of that? So, basically, you know, the first big bucket is, is does, it, does it fit for what you need? And I don't want to minimize that because um, that is a challenging um, piece right there. And, and frankly, I think, in my experience, a bit iterative of really understanding what the needs are, being able to bridge, um, you know, the, uh, the case that you're operating in, you know, malaria in this case, and the technology. Um, so that, that's the first part. Um, and then maybe the next three are maybe less obvious areas um, to, to think about, but I'll offer a couple of, a couple of thoughts here. Um, it, another one is, is, does the vendor share your passion? 
Um, I wouldn't say this is critical, but um, if you're going to partner with a technology company, it's probably going to be over a relatively, you know, uh, at least a couple of years. Um, you're going to be building relationships uh, with, you know, individuals in those companies. Um, you may become friends with them. Um, so th you want to know that they're, they're, they're aligned with, with your organization and that they share some of the same passion. Um, and that would impact on things like, well, you know, if you ask them to go to Niger or DRC or, or, or any number of other countries, are, are they willing to go? Uh, in some cases, we've worked with vendors where they said, no, we're not willing to go. So that clearly uh, doesn't work. Um, and then uh, do they listen to you? Um, if, if you have, you know, feature requests or, or, or anything, really, do they, do they actually listen to you um, and consider your needs um, and place some importance on them? Um, so that's uh, passion um, and alignment. Maybe the next one, probably one of the biggest uh, challenges that we see in this space, at least from my point of view, is, is maturity. Um, a lot of the tech firms that uh, operate in this space, I won't say all of them, but a lot of them tend to be smaller, um, which is great because they're most of them are more likely to be passionate about the topic and more likely to listen to you, but can sometimes have challenges supporting um, large-scale um, projects. You know, if you're covering an entire country like Nigeria, I mean, it's, it's an enormous country and, and maybe, maybe it's several countries. Um, so how can they support the, you know, if you have, uh, you know, thousands of users across the country, um, um, how, do they, how do they support them? What does their support model look like? Um, another thing to, to really think about, and this is almost always overlooked, but is, is a major gotcha, is the administrative functionality. Um, how does the platform uh, manage its users, access, um, you know, granting access, uh, monitoring usage, um, you know, maybe uh, breaking down things by geography or what have you. That is an incredibly important thing to have in place um, that allows you to manage um, manage a, a technology at scale. Um, and, and one of the bigger challenges that we face. And also including things like, you know, how does it integrate with other platforms? How, how nice does it play? Does it integrate with things like DHIS2 or others? Um, so, so sort of that maturity aspect is another thing to really look at. Um, and maybe the, the, um, the final one I'll just touch on is, is uh, transferability. Now, it's not always necessary that technology be transferred, you know, typically to new governments, but in a lot of cases it, it is, or, or maybe that is a part of the end goal is after the project's over, that technology be transferred. Um, it's a really complex issue, and I, I, fortunately I don't have a great answer for that, but it's something that should be thought about. What is the you know what is the necessity around transferability and just to note um, you know probably the major um, rubbing points are cost uh, uh, governments in particular that we work with tend to be very sensitive to cost and rightly so um, and another challenge is complexity if if the system itself is too many moving parts it's too complex um, that's going to be a real challenge um, so I think I will stop there back to you Sonia. Thank you very much, Nathan. Um, and our uh, next question uh, for this round is for Derek. And then we, after this, we will take uh, questions from the audience. So please remember to place your questions in the check box. Uh, they're coming in. That's very good to see. So Derek, I would like to ask you, how are models for collaboration between donors, governments, implementers, and technology providers evolving to accelerate uh, the global eradication of malaria? Hi, thanks, Sonia, and uh, and a big thanks to CRS and NetHope uh, for organizing this webinar and the opportunity to share my perspective on this topic. Um, global eradication of malaria demands a strong collaboration between malaria control programs, NGOs, and implementing partners, tech providers, and, and really all of us working in this field. And as the technologies that we use to combat malaria evolve, our model for collaboration needs to evolve as well. Nate just talked about transferability. Uh, there's been a widespread move uh, towards open source technology solutions to prevent vendor lock-in and enable long-term sustainable operation of these systems by government staff. To see these solutions running sustainably at scale, however, we need a model that enables more peer-to-peer uh, -peer knowledge sharing between countries 
where system admins and users can share tips and troubleshooting advice, relying less on direct technical support from tech, te from tech for, uh, providers directly. Governments and donors are also looking for ways to extend their return on investment when they train staff and acquire hardware. Extensible software that's used for malaria can be adapted to cover other diseases in the future too, extending the, the, the return on, on the costs of those systems. This means we need to take other diseases into account now and consult experts in other health program areas when we're designing our malaria systems by presenting those designs uh, for public consultation. And as we move from control to elimination, uh, as Annie mentioned, interventions need to be faster, more targeted, more closely monitored. There's an ever greater need for alignment between countries uh, and the WHO on malaria protocols. Uh, neighboring countries have to be working together uh, across borders. Um, WHO protocols need to be adapted to fit local context and we need to be learning from each other in real time. As a global network, we need to enable faster sharing and iteration on these protocols, the digital tools that we're using, and the best practices and lessons learned that we all have. And that's precisely what the team at CRS and NetHope is doing here today with this webinar. And this is exactly what we're doing as well with the Digital Solutions for Malaria Elimination Community, uh, or DSME for short. Over the past 16 months, this community of implementers and tech providers have been coming together on a monthly basis uh, to demo uh, some of the technologies that you heard about uh, on this webinar and to share successes and challenges uh, to identify the best designs, the most valuable new features, and the most effective protocols uh, for different malaria interventions. We have uh, 30 organizations represented to date in this community and membership is open uh, to any organization that is willing uh, to commit a couple of hours per time uh, 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 per month to engage actively in this conversation and shares that passion that Nate was speaking about. All of our speakers today are active participants in this community. And I'd like to encourage those of you attending this webinar to get involved too by visiting dsme.community. As the community grows, it increases our ability to actively drive donors towards the catalytic funding that meets the greatest needs for all of us. In the past year, we've driven funding towards the creation of several different open source global goods, uh, which have been produced by community members, published on GitHub, and presented on our community calls. These include uh, an open, open source code library uh, called the Geospatial Widget that allows any Android app developer to embed a map-based interface into their mobile applications. Uh, this widget is actually already integrated into some of the tools that Acros is using for its interventions. Uh, a platform called the Common Geo Registry uh, that allows different information systems to access the same published master list of villages households and other geographical points and polygons that might be relevant to malaria program planning. This aligns with the value and the need for geospatial data that Annie and Jess mentioned um, earlier. Also a common data dictionary which defines all of the data points recommended for collection that will be assessed later on by the WHO to certify the country is malaria free once it's gotten there. And an implementation toolkit uh, which is designed uh, as um, generic materials uh, that uh, any uh, implementer of digital solutions used for malaria elimination that follow WHO protocols. Um, and it includes a standard work plan, standard operating procedures for issue reporting and tech support uh, and training materials. Every month, we invite community members to share updates about their work, new findings from research, and demos of new tech tools. It creates a venue for sharing lessons learned, um, both publicly and frequently, which I think is one of the most important aspects of us coming together. Um, it also creates a transparency to, to prevent redundancies in funding and effort. The community is an opportunity for continual public consultation, allowing implementers and tech providers uh, to test and vet their newest designs with peers and get quick iterative feedback. 
Now we know that there is a risk that as we get nearer to elimination, funding can shift to higher burden diseases and stop short of achieving success of complete eradication. So now is our opportunity to come together as a global community and ensure that we make the best use of the resources that we have available to us today to create effective tools that will see us through the end of this disease and potentially many others. Thanks so much for the time. And again, please join us at uh, dsme.community to continue this conversation after the webinar. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, I've just shared the link in the chat box as well. And I also like to mention that we will share an, a summary after the uh, webinar with the recording and the links as well. Um, thank you very much to all the speakers for your um, insight. And um, we have received a number of questions. So we we'll, might not get through all of the questions, but um, let's get started. Um, Ani, the first question is for you. Um, it says, uh, you use the term vector control. Can you define that term um, in the sense you used it and the population housing identification sounds interesting. If you could maybe expand to that a little bit more as well. Um, sure, yes. So vector control is an um, umbrella term for different kinds of solutions that help us attack or diminish the population of generally in the malaria world, the, the malaria vector, the Anopheles mosquito. Uh, so it could be indoor residual spraying, which is one that uh, I was talking a lot about in the, during the first question. It, it could be talking about net distribution, uh, bed nets, which can be treated with chemicals or untreated both prevent vectors, the mosquitoes, from biting the host, the humans, as well as can, can help kill the population of mosquitoes. Uh, there are also other vector control methods I didn't mention. Larviciding is another one of them where essentially potential breeding sites for mosquitoes are treated with a chemical that prevents them from developing into adult mosquitoes able to, able to transmit the disease. So it's, it's, and it's bigger than just malaria. Of course, there are other diseases that uh, are vector-borne and that, that uh, also can benefit from some of the same, the same methods and interventions. The, the population and housing identification, I think, was, is, is a discussion that is a part of two different pieces of the work we do. One, in, in any of the work we, we do that, that uses these spatial approaches to measuring and delivering services. Part of that is identifying first where the population is. And that is very similar to, in, in fact, the same process that, that Jess described that the HOT community and the HOT team works on, essentially using satellite imagery to identify housing structures and then to be able to predict by a very simple count of the housing structures as well as layering on population models, being able to predict where, where people are. Uh, and that feeds into the geotagging piece of, of the approach, which, which is field-based. So those identification of population distribution that happens as part of a, a planning phase of any intervention then feeds into a field-based tool that allows field workers who might be community health workers, uh, they might be other health facility empl employees, environmental health technicians, uh, any, any kind of personnel who's going into communities to deliver services. They are then using a, a mobile tool that allows them to see where they are, where they're going on a digital map that's reliant on that spatial population imagery and predictions done in the planning phase. They're able to use that tool to identify where people are and confirm that services are delivered to specific houses by essentially geotagging them. So collecting data that is tied to a specific latitude and longitude that can be tracked over time as well as within individual interventions. So it's, it's an incredibly powerful way to, to advance the, the goals we have in malaria elimination because it allows us not only to ensure that uh, 
drugs are being delivered to the houses we intend them to be delivered to, it also allows us to have a better understanding of the impact of this work. So in, in collecting data at a very granular level, at a house level with the latitude and longitude tied to it, we're, we're able to start generating incredibly complex spatial data sets that allow us to do much more detailed analyses on which malaria interventions are impactful or more impactful and in which combinations they're most impactful and in which kinds of environments. Adding, adding that spatial component to data collection really opens up a whole, a whole bunch of opportunities for understanding how we can move towards malaria elimination. Thank, thank you very much, Annie. Um, our next question is also uh, mapping related, Jess, that's a question for you. Um, how do you see the OpenStreetMap being combined or integrated with other digital uh, decision support system tools in the fight against malaria? And also, could you please um, briefly share on how you're recruiting and training um, your volunteers? question for me um, as far as how geospatial data can be used uh, with tools and how it improves current interventions. Um, but specifically with OpenStreetMap data, what makes it stand apart is its open source data and its crowdsourced, largely coming from local communities themselves. So even when we do run these large campaigns, um, like the malaria mapping campaign I discussed where we, brought, we were able to map almost 5 million buildings. In general, with OpenStreetMap, it's local people mapping their local communities. Um, so it really brings the ownership down to the local level. Um, but in terms of ownership, it's open source data. And that's really what sets it apart um, is that anyone and everyone can use this data. Previously, um, most data would be proprietary or largely controlled um, by specific actors, but having it as open source allows us to be distributed and more rapidly used for interventions. Uh, so that's, that's really where OpenStreetMap uh, can be integrated with these support systems and tools in fighting malaria. Um, really any tool or any system that already uses GIS or spatial analysis can, can use this data. Um, and then more specifically, um, so the second question um, about recruiting and training volunteers. So anyone can become a remote mapping volunteer. It really just takes access to a computer and an internet connection. It doesn't even have to be a consistent internet connection, to be honest. Um, so we recruit uh, volunteers from various locations. Oftentimes it's people who hear about our work and want to just become involved. Um, but we also do active recruiting with universities and uh, youth groups around the world, um, especially targeting locations across Sub-Saharan Africa and um, Southeast Asia are some of the strong points um, for uh, gathering remote mappers. Like I said earlier, many uh, many remote mappers are mapping their local communities. Um, but ultimately, anyone can become a remote mapping volunteer, and we provide training through our uh, through our website as well as providing our own webinars. And then the next step beyond that is, especially when we are doing field data collection, um, ensuring that validation and um, extra attention is given to that data to ensure quality, and that's done through additional training of volunteers. Thank you very much. Um, my next question is for all panelists, but um, I will initially ask Sarah for an answer and then see if somebody else likes to chip in. So the question is, um, um, at what stage do you feel that funding or investing in technology and digital, to, digital tools to eliminate malaria is as important as funding and distributing bed nets, spraying, or other physical interventions? Thanks, Sonia. Um, I think um, I think with anything, uh, it's you know about having a, a complementary approach. And I think when you're talking about um, working. Uh, to eliminate malaria, um, you know, it's it, you do need to to think of uh, using digital tools just 
uh, to increase the, although they are, you know, expensive to implement, um, the the sort of the degree of um, effort required to um, eliminate malaria when you are at low low levels. Um, is is high, and I think digital tools can provide a, um, you know, the ability to efficiently um, target, um, you know, uh, hotspots, and uh, and to 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 address that those that those last, um, you know, cases, um, and and to get to, uh, to over the finish line. Of course, you know, elimination efforts for other diseases have been. Addressed historically without, um, you know, digital solutions. But I think, um, you know, since we have that ability, it makes sense to to use them. And um, and you know, and they, when you're talking in this context, I would say, the the benefits they get in terms of um, improving improving efficiencies do make them, uh, you know, a strong part um, of. Um, of you know the activities alongside um, uh, you know more traditional uh, activities such as uh, you know IRS or bed net distributions etc. Um, but I'll be interested to hear what my my colleagues uh, also say. The same here. Yes. Anybody would like to add uh, to this answer? Sure. Um, uh, I'll, I'll jump in there and uh, say that. Um, the stage uh, where um, tech tools uh, should be funded and invested in, um, in addition to other commodities that are, are essential to malaria program um, or malaria intervention uh, execution, I think is when a country malaria control program is able to make that informed decision themselves based on the resources that they have available uh, the evidence of success that they've seen and heard about, um, these funding decisions and investments uh, need to be driven on a country-by-country -country context, uh, and they need to be driven by governments based on what they are seeing and hearing about what works uh, elsewhere in, in the world. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Um, any other um, comments around funding or investment? In technology for malaria prevention or elimination. I'll just add one thing, and I agree fully with what both Sarah and Derek have said, but and I think part of the transition in, in governments viewing, you know, the investment as worthwhile is seeing, in a sense, technology as, as its own intervention through through the improvements that it brings to the potential impact that's being delivered by those physical services. So if, if the, the technology service that you're using can improve the way that, can improve the efficiency with which community health workers are following up cases, then that, that in and of itself might be an intervention of sorts. So I think once, once uh, those who are investing funds, once countries are, are seeing the technology as you know, as essential as ITN distribution or uh, test and treat protocols because it elevates those services in their impact so much, I think that's the point at which the investments will, will pick up. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Annie. Um, I guess the next question might also be funding related, but possibly also with a partnership angle. Uh, the question is, um, what are the what what are the opportunities available for individual small technology firms in Africa or particularly in Nigeria? Um, and um, yeah, it, it particularly is it with regards to partnerships or, or, or funding and I wanted to see if there might be any, any advice for, for our audience member. I can jump in here. This is Nate. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think in general in, in the uh, donor environment we have today, I think that there's a real interest in in partnering with the private sector and with local organizations. So I think there's there's a big driver behind that. Um, I think the challenge is it's um, at least from my, my perspective, you, you don't hear about them. Um, at least uh, I don't hear about them too much. Um, so I think uh, more visibility is part of that um, 
part of the answer or, or you know, um, part of the challenge there. Um, and I'd also say, you know, back to some of my points earlier, um, I think, you know, in evaluating technology companies, again, uh, looking at the maturity is going to be important. So um, I think that's also a factor as well. Thanks. Thank you, Nate. Any any other comments? Um, I wanted to uh, uh, just agree wholeheartedly with Nate that there is a, a, a wonderful um, opportunity here uh, for grassroots organizations to get involved with some of the global networks um, that are, are leading some of the design decisions for open source solutions and contribute to that discussion um, and identify some of the open source products that are being rolled out in dozens of countries today uh, to support malaria elimination initiatives um, and get involved, contribute to the code, contribute to implementation locally, build up local uh, capacity to support the implementation of those tools in your countries. And uh, there's, there's a wonderful opportunity there uh, to, uh, to get involved uh, from the ground up. Thank, thank you, Derek. Um, we also had a number of questions around training and awareness. So um, I'd like to uh, I guess pick one of the questions first. Um, uh, here, um, is there any examples of digital technology, um, for example, mobile apps, videos, or combinations of them that has been used uh, to educate people to prevent or fight against malaria? So are there any uh, maybe interesting successful examples you know of and you would like to share? Um, let's see. Can, Maybe I'll ask Sarah first, and then I'll, I'll ask anybody else to jump in while we can think about it. Uh, sure. Um, I mean, within our, our own app application, Upscale in Mozambique, um, I mean, that's uh, supporting uh, community health workers uh, in terms of um, supporting them to about um, how to prevent and, and, and uh, treat malaria within their communities. Um, so that's just one example. Uh, there are definitely loads out there, um, uh, but, but that's one example I can give from, from our own organization. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone else would like to share some uh, examples um, on digital technology used to create awareness or educate uh, people or communities? Or, um, the other question we had was also if there is any um, lessons learned or practical tips on uh, training your partners or um, regional partners um, on uh, the technology used. So maybe there is also um, a way. Um, this is sort of, I guess, kind of like our last question. So maybe either um, if you want to look at. Um, uh, the, the training aspect, or alternatively, if, if there is any other um, uh, kind of like lessons learned or practical tips you'd like to share. Um, just going to see, um, maybe I'll just do the rounds as we um, appear here on the screen, and I'll just ask Annie first if you have any sort of um, lessons learned or sort of final comments you'd like to share, and then we, we uh, move along to Nate and Jess and Sarah and Derek. Sure. Thanks, Sonia. And I think this question around training actually is, leads nicely into what I would say is a, a very important lesson that, that we've learned, which is that knowing who your users are and what, what their incentives are in, in the system that you're designing and also what their capabilities are to, to use the system and to, to learn is, is of critical importance. Uh, you know, no technology on its own will thrive. You need to have a strong technology, you need to be well aware of the people who are using the technology, and you need you know, processes, protocols to guide, to guide the interface of those two to be successful and have a strong system. So I would say before even starting your technology selection, which technology partner should I use, which digital tool should I use, the most important thing is knowing who is going to be using, who's going to be using the tool and what it is that they, that they hope to get out of it and how, think, thinking through how a tool can be designed with, with those pieces in mind, I think is, is the biggest lesson that, yeah, that I feel we've, we've learned and the once you learn that I think can, can make 
these kinds of systems much more successful. Thanks. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Nate, any any lessons learned or final comments from you you'd like to share? Sure. I mean, I can sort of build on the, the training um, aspect. Um, the project that I've supported in Nigeria, it's a, a just a mass campaign, so basically distribution of, of nets, and we use a, a mobile um, a mobile platform to um, to register households and to track distribution. Um, the part about training is actually incredibly important and something that was front and center when we started this project. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about training, the materials, and how that links with the support model. Um, and I think it's been quite successful. Um, you know, to date, I think is we've trained maybe about I want to say about 30,000 people uh, on the use of, of this technology. Um, so it's, it's been a very big component of this project is is uh, training individuals and making sure they understand how to use the platform and and, um, and where to get support. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Nate. Uh, Jess, do you have any um, less comments or lessons learned you'd like to share? Yeah, two things. Um, one is the importance of making sure that the technology that you are using is appropriate for the environment and the users. Um, oftentimes in areas where data collection is happening, this is in remote areas with no access to internet or low access to internet. So you need to make sure that you're thinking through um, how the data is being transferred, how the data is being collected, and the uh, the level of sophistication of the tools being used, um, and we find that the simpler the tools, the better. Um, and we try to, in our experience, have used um, mobile applications that can largely be run on people's devices that they already have, and that's usually going to be a more successful data collection experience is when we're using tools that have um, very low impact and are able to run on devices people are already familiar with. Um, and along those lines, um, the other piece of advice is don't underestimate um, people's ability to pick up technology very fast. Uh, we've had a wide range of people using the tools in the field, everyone from uh, young students who we anticipated being able to pick up these tools very easily to elderly uh, members of the community who've never handled mobile phones before, um, and by the end of a day or two of training, we're out in the field collecting geospatial data. So just make sure that you are understanding your environment, but also not underestimating the people that um, are collecting the data. Thank you very much. I just realized we're already at the end of the hour, so <laughs> I'm very sorry. Um, Sarah, Derek, if you just have maybe a very quick last comment and then we wrap it up here. <laughs> Sorry to keep it very short. Sure. I would just add to what already has been stated, but um, to say that you should integrate it within existing processes. Try integrate your technology training within existing training processes. And if there's already existing uh, training imagery and things like that, for instance, we've tried to use that within our apps to try get people better accustomed to, to using a new tool. Thank you. Derek? Uh, I just wanted to note that, you know, I think we all individually know the challenges that we face in our own contexts, and to really emphasize that there's an immense strength in our ability to come together and share those challenges with each other and find the common solutions uh, that are going to get us to eradication faster. Thank you. That is very well said, and I think that um, um, very much yeah, wraps up our webinar. Thank you all very much for sharing uh, so, so much insight and, um, um, and also for everyone for attending this webinar. Um, we will take a break in May um, as we will be at the ICT4D conference in Kampala. Um, and then uh, we will reconvene in, on June 18th and also June 25th, where we will share some lessons learned from the conference um, in this um, ICT4D webinar group. Thank you very much um, for, uh, to NetHope for facilitating us again. 
And um, we'd like to ask everybody um, when you sign off to please also fill out the uh, webinar questionnaire. Um, so we really like to hear your feedback. Um, so have a wonderful day and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you for producing you. these webinars. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.